So hello there, my name is Tamne Bakshi, and welcome to the second episode of the Learn Deep Learning from Scratch series. Today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the very fundamentals of machine learning technology. We're also going to be covering the basic building block of deep neural networks, perceptrons. Now, here's the thing. As I mentioned in the introduction to this series, in order to understand machine learning and deep learning more effectively, it is important to have at least a little bit of an understanding of the mathematics that go behind neural networks. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and simplify this math as much as possible and make it so that you only really need to understand the parts that are really relevant to deep learning technology. Specifically, we're going to be covering getting derivatives of functions, what that even means, and how you can actually use those derivatives to optimize a function. Now, what exactly does that mean? I know it sounds really complex. I'm going to show you in just a moment. Before we start, though, I do want to say really quickly that if you do enjoy this kind of content, please do consider subscribing to the channel as it really does help out a lot. And of course, please do consider liking the tutorial as well if you did enjoy it. Feel free to put your questions down in the comments below, and I'll go ahead and respond as soon as possible. Now, before we dive into the mathematics of these concepts, how about we take a look at the very basic building block of these deep neural networks in the first place, the perceptron. Now, as I mentioned before, machine learning technology is all about taking an input, we'll call it X, and predicting the output based off of that input, say Y. Now, this could be all kinds of things. X could be a picture of dogs and cats, and Y could be the label. Is this a dog or is this a cat? X could be historical stock prices, and Y could be future stock prices. Basically, you know that there's some kind of causal link between X and Y, and you're trying to use mathematics to figure out what that link is so that you can take some value of X and predict what Y should be. Now, what goes behind the deep learning systems that actually do this are basic building blocks called perceptrons. You can see in a little diagram of a perceptron on screen right now. Now, this diagram is pretty simple. It's literally just two circles and an arrow. These circles we're going to call nodes or neurons. We can use the term interchangeably. And the circles have a connecting arrow between them. So the one on the left connects to the one on the right. Now, the node on the left, we're going to label that as the input node or the input neuron. And the node on the right, we're going to label the output neuron. Basically, what we're doing is we're saying that this perceptron on the left, the input one, is where we feed in our X, our input. And what we want to do is we want to make it so that through that connection, we're able to predict the value through the output neuron. The way we figure out what the value of the output neuron should be, which is the prediction of our network, is by using W, which is the weight associated with the connection between I and O. Now, these perceptrons can model all kinds of tasks. For example, let's just say we wanted to build a simple perceptron that takes in an input and outputs the negated number that we input. So, for example, we feed it a 4, gives us a negative 4, we give it a 1, gives us a negative 1, or we feed it a negative 0.5 and it gives us a positive 0.5. So, whatever we input, it gives us our negated input as output. Now, the way we determine the value of the output perceptron is actually pretty simple. It's just a mathematical function that takes the input from the input perceptron, as well as the weight between the input and output, and multiplies them. That's it. So, if we were to use this rule, you can pretty immediately tell, this is basic math, that the weight in this case should be negative 1. Because if the weight is negative 1, then when you multiply the input, the output is the negated input. 3 would become negative 3. Negative 4 would become positive 4 when multiplied by negative 1. Now, the thing about this function is that while it does work great, it's never really obvious what the value of the weight should be. Now, here's the thing. In this case, it was very easy for us to tell, well, we want to negate the input, so we just want to multiply by negative 1. But what if you had a more complex task, like actually predicting stock prices or determining if an image contains a cat or a dog? In that case, you don't really know what to multiply by. That's something that you want to leave up to the computer to decide. And this is where the more slightly advanced mathematics come in. Now, to dive into these slightly more advanced mathematics, let's go ahead and take a look at a graph. Now, the graph on screen is plotting out a pretty simple function. Now, let's just say you think of this function as a one-dimensional set of hills to the left and right with a valley in the middle. All right. Now, there's a ball on this hill 
Now, of course, in the real world, if we were to apply the laws of physics, this ball would roll down and get down to that little base in the middle. Because, of course, gravity wants the ball to come down. Now, let's just bring the ball back up for a moment. Let's freeze it in time. And there's one thing that I want you to notice. As the ball falls down, it has this thing called velocity. Now, what velocity tells us is really two things. It's telling us both the direction in which that ball is moving, right? So where exactly is it moving? In this case, is it moving to the left or to the right? And also, it tells us the magnitude of its movement. It tells us the speed. Now, you know, in some cases, this could be pretty flat or it could be pretty steep. But something to keep in mind is that this isn't necessarily a 100% accurate representation of velocity and rather is an analogy for derivatives. And believe it or not, even though it might sound a lot scarier, the derivative of a function is really just telling you the velocity at a certain point. So let's go ahead and go back to the ball example. Now let's just say we were to go ahead and calculate the derivative of this function. So if I go ahead and calculate the derivative of this function at that point, again, which is basically, you know, as an analogy, the velocity of the ball, and if I were to go ahead and sort of plot it out so it's a little bit easier to imagine what exactly that means, as you can see, I can make this representation. Now, in this specific case, as you can see, I've got an arrow pointing to the left. What that means is that the derivative is telling us that in order to reduce the value of y, we need to move left on the x-axis, all right? So in order to move the ball down, we gotta move the ball left. That's one thing. Now, the other white line that you're seeing, that's what's called the tangent line. Now, that's what's telling us the magnitude of that movement. How steep is the line that the ball is going down at that specific point? Now, that steepness can help us determine how fast the ball is actually moving. So again, the analogy to velocity. Now, if I were to go ahead and animate this ball moving down for you, you can see that as we go down and as the rate of change, as the steepness of the function decreases, that line gets flatter and flatter until we're at the very bottom where it's completely flat. And of course, the arrow, really in this case, it just happens to be pointing left because that's just where it was last. Uh, but in this case, it could be pointing left or right. We're at the exact middle um, and there's no movement to uh, happening. But then if we were to move this ball over to the left side of this hill, as you can see, we get kind of like the opposite effect. In this case, in order to move the ball down, it needs to move to the right on the x-axis, and that's why the arrow is pointing there. That's what the derivative function is telling us. And as you can see, the white line has also slightly shifted so that we can see that, well, this is the slope of the function. This is how fast the function is changing at that point. Again, analogy to velocity, it's the speed of the change of that function. Now let's just go ahead and move that ball back for a moment. And let me go ahead and help you convert this sort of more beautiful interpretation of a derivative to the actual value. Now, as you can see in this specific case, the arrow is pointing left, all right? Because the arrow is pointing left, that means the derivative is negative. So we know one thing already, that the value of the derivative of this function at this point is going to be a negative number. The next thing we know is, well, we can see the slope. And if we go ahead and convert that slope to an actual number, we get, in this specific case, 1.37. So this more beautiful interpretation of derivative you were seeing really just means that at that specific point, the derivative is negative 1.37. Now, one thing I will note is that what I've been saying here is a slightly inaccurate representation of the derivative. In reality, this number is not negative, it's positive. Let me show you why. And in order to understand, let's go ahead and actually plot out the derivative of this function. Now, when we plot it, you can see that when the function is steeper, you see a peak in the derivative function. That is because when the function itself is changing more quickly, the derivative is going to be a higher value. Remember, it's telling us that speed as a velocity analogy. However, the derivative doesn't tell us where to go to decrease the value of the function, to move the ball down. The derivative really tells us where to go to move the ball up. This is called ascent. But what we want to do in the world of deep learning is called descent, which is why I sort of showed you this analogy of it being negative. However, in reality, the derivative at that point is positive. So I do want, to, want you to keep that in mind. In the world of machine learning and deep learning, while we do usually, or really always, negate our derivatives to move the ball down for reasons that you'll understand in a later episode, 
the actual derivative would tell us how to move the value up. All right, so now that you understand this basic concept of derivatives, let me show you one more example of a function and its derivative, just to help you wrap your head around the concept a little bit more. So in this case, I've plotted out a function, which is the blue line, called sigmoid. All right, this is a slightly modified version of sigmoid, but it is based off of the sigmoid function. And the red line is its derivative. As you can tell, the way this function works is that towards the ends, it sort of tapers off and it gets more flat. But towards the middle, when x is equal to zero, it's growing at its quickest rate, meaning the smallest change in x would result in a larger change in the actual function. And the derivative actually tells us this information. You can see that the derivative peaks when x is equal to zero. And so does the steepness of the function at x equals zero. So I hope that this visualization sort of helps you sort of nail in the idea that what the derivative is telling us is not only where the function is increasing in value towards the left or towards the right, but also just how fast it's increasing in value as well. And so that's all the math that you need to understand to get into the world of deep learning technology. Now, of course, though, there is a little bit more. You're probably wondering, well, sure, derivative functions are great, but why in the world would we ever use them? Well, let me show you. It's because the derivative of a function can help us do what's known as optimization. For example, let's just say we've got the dot on this function, all right? That point is at x equals three. Now, as we can see, the dot's pretty high up. We want to move the dot down. We want to move it down. So what should the value of x be in order to move it as far down as possible? And we know, just by looking at the graph, that x should be equal to zero. And that's because this is one dimensional. We can pretty easily kind of scroll through a graph and figure out what the value should be. But the issue is that neural networks aren't just one dimensional, right? The real deep neural networks that we're gonna build have many hundreds or thousands or millions of dimensions. We can't even visualize that. Forget actually exploring the space. And so therefore, we need to figure out an automated mathematical way to figure out how to move that point down. And well, I'm gonna show you how to do exactly that. As we can see, this function starts at x equals three. And before we can understand how we can move it down with math, we need to understand something that's known as the update function. The update function, which I'm gonna label u, takes three arguments. It takes x, y, and z. And what it returns is simply x minus y times z. Now you're probably wondering, what's the purpose of this function? Well, what this function enables us to do is actually really powerful. What it does is it takes three things. It takes x, which is the input to a certain function. It takes y, which is the derivative of that function at x. And it also takes z, which is something that's known as a learning rate. And I'll talk about what that is in a moment. What the update function does is it returns to us a new value of x, meaning a new value that we can feed into the function in order to reduce the output from that function, in order to make it smaller. That is, to move the dot down the hill, right, down that slope. Now, the way it does this is by taking the actual input to the function and basically removing the derivative value from it. Because remember, the derivative is telling us where to move and how much to move in order to increase the output of the function. Well, what that means is if we go in the opposite direction of the derivative, we're going to decrease the value of the function, move the ball down. And so by removing that derivative value from the input to the function, we end up making the output of the function, if we use that new value, lower. Now, here's the thing, though. The derivative at some certain points can be really, really steep, right? So if you remember where x equals 3, the derivative is very steep. And what that means is the derivative is usually a large value. And when you negate that entire value from the actual input of the function, you usually end up overshooting, right? The ball ends up going way too far. So what we actually do is we multiply that derivative by a learning rate to scale it down. In this case, we're going to be using a learning rate of 0 0.5, and you'll see that in a moment. So basically what we're trying to do is we half the actual derivative value, we negate it, and then combine that value with the input to the function. This gives us the new input to the function, which should theoretically give us, or really we know it's going to give us, a smaller output value. Let's take a look at that. Now what I'm gonna go ahead and do is plot out some of the actual values that we're gonna get from this function. So 
x equals 3, the output of the function is 3.65. That's a really large value, and we want to bring it down to 0, okay? Now, if we were to take a look at the derivative of the function at point x equals 3, we see that the derivative tells us 1.21. This means it's positive, meaning go towards the right to increase the value of the function, and the magnitude, the speed of that change is 1.21 units. So what we want to do is we want to negate that, because of course we want to decrease the output of the function, and we want to have that too. So we're going to feed 3, 1.21, and 0 0.5, which is the input to the function, the derivative at that point, and the learning rate respectively, into the update function, and it gives us a value of 2.39. This is going to be the new input to the function, meaning that the point has actually moved from x equals 3 to x equals 2.39. So, as you can see, we just move the dot down. All right, so let's go ahead and redo that little bit of math. So now when we feed 2.39 into the function, we see the output is 2.68. That's so great. We went from 3.6 to 2.6. Now, if we were to get the derivative at this point, it gives us 1.9, which means it's increased in slope. The magnitude has actually increased by moving down, right? The function is more steep at this point. So if we were to feed in the previous input, 2.39, as well as the derivative, 1.9, and of course our learning rate, 0.5, we get a new input to the function of 1.44. As you can see, we are trending towards x equals 0, but let's see if this trend continues to uh, hold up. So we're going to move the ball down to x equals 1.44, as you can see, pretty big jump, and we're going to redo that math once again. So we feed in 1.44, and now we're in the zeros. So the output from the function is 0 0.89. Derivative is 1.56, which is still pretty steep. And then we feed that info into the update function, and it says your new x value should be 0 0.66. So we move the dot to 0 0.66. As you can see, we're getting to pretty flat territory. And if we go ahead and calculate the slope once more, the slope has now gone from like 1.5 to simply 0 0.46. And so the slope is decreasing, right? Because if you take a look at the function, it's getting flatter and flatter as we get towards x equals zero. Now, if we were to do, you know, tens or maybe hundreds of iterations of this sort of optimization procedure, then we would eventually get x equals zero. However, in this case, I don't want to have to what? I don't want to sort of put you through that effort of watching paint dry and watching this gets towards uh, x equals zero. So I've just done a couple of iterations, and as you can see, we do get pretty close to the output of the function being an actual zero. In this case, it brings us to 0 0.01, which is incredibly close to what we want. And x, in this case, which is our input to the function, is 0 0.23. Now, you might be wondering, well, sure, but what is the point of all of this? Why would I ever want to figure out how to reduce the value of a mathematical function based off the input parameters to it? Well, let me tell you why. It's because, think back to our perceptron. Well, in our perceptron's case, we knew what the input and the output should have been, but we did not know what the weight should have been to determine how to get that correct output. Well, by using this exact mathematical procedure that I've described to you, you can automatically figure out the value of that weight using this procedure, and this is known as gradient descent. Gradient is just a fancy word for derivative. Uh, specifically, it is the derivative of the function with respect to all of its input parameters, and we'll be covering exactly what that means in a future episode. You don't need to worry about it right now. All you need to know is that by finding the derivative of the function, which in this case is the perceptron along with what's known as an error function, you can actually figure out what that weight needs to be. Now, in the next episode, I'm going to be showing you how you can actually implement that error function, the perceptron, and the derivative descent in Python using the TensorFlow library. It's going to be really fun, and I'm going to show you how you can actually implement this optimization using real Python code. Thank you very much for joining today. I do hope you enjoyed. Now, of course, if you did, please do make sure to leave a like down below and subscribe to the channel as it really does help out a lot and turn on notifications so you know when I release the next episode in this series. As I mentioned, we're going to be covering how you can actually implement the concepts that you learned today in Python and how you can use them to build a basic perceptron. Then we're going to do some really fun flower classification using more advanced multi-layer perceptron neural networks. Once again, no need to worry about what all that means just yet. It sounds fancy, but it's really not. I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye.